Okay, I'm ready. I'd say anytime you're ready, you can start. All right. Hi, all. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. We have with us our colloquium speaker, Professor Jason Hessels, all the way from Amsterdam. Um, I have had the amazing privilege to have Jason as my PhD supervisor, where he not only taught me all and everything that I know about pulsars, but also, and most formatively, about punk and rock music, introducing Frank Zappa and ACDC's Thunderstruck. Jason did his PhD in 2007 from McGill University in Montreal, Canada, where he found the fastest millisecond pulsar that we know of, pulsar 1748-244680, rotating at about 716 hertz. After his PhD, he won Canadian Prize Postdoctoral Fellowship and took it to Amsterdam between 2006 and 2008. Since then, he has won Winnie, Witty, and Vichy grants from the Dutch Research Council and European Research Council starting grant. He has donned several impressive scientific hats as a junior scientist, head of astronomy at Astron and a chief astronomer now uh, at Astron in Netherlands. He has a prolific scientific repertoire comprising of about 230 publications, spanning hit lists on his album of discoveries such as uh, discovery of the fastest pulsar, triple pulsar system, transitional millisecond pulsars, localizing, repeating fast radio burst, and uh, understanding environment and surroundings of both FRB 12, 2011 or 12. In 2014, Jason was appointed as a professor, uh, associate professor at University of Amsterdam. In 2016, a member of the Young Academy um, of the Royal Dutch Academy of Sciences for his founding role in low frequency array. And last year he was awarded the prestigious professorship at University of Amsterdam in observational high energy astrophysics. He's now spearheading the launch of LOFAR 2.0 or Duplo. And will be talking to us a lot more about fast radio bursts today. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I'll share my screen now. Um... There we go. Okay, I'll assume that this is all visible. Um, I'd like to, to start by uh, wishing everyone the, the best for the, the coming year in terms of health and happiness. I was explaining, uh, you know, before people were joining how, uh, how bad the COVID situation currently is here in, in Amsterdam. But let's, uh, let's talk about something that's much nicer than uh, than talking about Corona, let's talk about fast radio bursts. Uh, so I've pitched this talk to, to be as accessible as possible to, uh, to non-experts in the first half. In the second half, I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail about what uh, my group here in Amsterdam is, is doing in terms of fast radio bursts. Um, so maybe, you know, slight, slight apologies to the experts in the audience for, for the first half of the talk. I'm not sure I'll tell you anything you don't, don't already know, but as this is a colloquium, uh, decided to make it as accessible as possible. So um, let's talk about fast radio bursts, what, what they are. Um, many of you have probably heard of the Lorimer burst, even if you don't work in this, in this field, because in, in 2007, uh, uh, Dunk Lorimer and a student he was working with, uh, they were searching for, for single pulses from, from pulsars towards the direction of the Magellanic Clouds in, in archival data from, from the Parkes Radio Telescope. And, uh, and unbeknownst to them, there was a, an even more interesting signal in the data than uh, single pulses from, from a young pulsar. What they found at that time, and which was later termed the Lorimer burst, was, was the first established fast radio burst. And this is, of course, an artist's conception showing you the Parkes, Parkes telescope here. Here's a much less lovely picture of the actual data. This is a, a dynamic spectrum. So you'll see this in a lot of the, the plots in the talk. A dynamic spectrum is just showing us the the various channels, uh, different radio frequencies or equivalently radio wavelengths as a function of time. And, and here we see this Lorimer burst, this now famous astro astrophysical event. We can see it sweeping through this diagram because the signal is arriving earlier at the highest uh, observed frequencies and later at lower frequencies. 
If one corrects for this effect shown in the inset, you know, and adds all of the different observed frequencies together, you get this impulsive event lasting for only a few milliseconds or so, which by the way is, you know, faster than the blink of an eye by about a factor of 100 or so. And why was this interesting? Because, you know, pulsars, they produce individual uh, pulses that can, that can be uh, detected with a radio telescope. We've known about them, well, at the time we knew about them for 40 years already. But what was particularly interesting about this, this Lorimer burst was the fact that this, this delay, this dispersive delay, which has to do with the fact that the signal is tra traveling through the ionized uh, interstellar medium of our galaxy, so there's a frequency dependent light travel time, um, the expected delay from the interstellar medium of our galaxy was much, much smaller than the observed delay, uh, indicating that the, either there must have been you know, some additional uh, uh, anomalous uh, amount of interstellar ionized material between us and, and this particular radio burst, or perhaps that the, the burst was coming from much further away and that the ionized medium that it was traveling through was not just the interstellar medium, of our own galaxy, but potentially also the intergalactic medium and the interstellar medium of a host galaxy, the potential for a radio burst coming from actually cosmological distances. Um, so this was extremely exciting. I remember I was finishing my PhD at the, at the time and I was extremely excited about the, the discovery of this event. I won't go into the history of, you know, what happened in the years afterwards because, you know, while there was a lot of excitement, there was also a lot of skepticism about uh, whether these were genuine astrophysical events. And in the end, it turns out that this phenomenon is genuinely astrophysical. Okay, so we have this Lorimer burst, which basically launches, launches the field uh, uh, about 14 years ago. And again, what was spectacular about this, if we consider, you know, this transient phase space here, if we look at um, uh, radio uh, radio transients as a function of uh, their time scale so shown on the x-axis is essentially a proxy for time scale going from incredibly short time scales of nanoseconds to time scales of years um, if we plot those uh, those time scales versus some kind of pseudo uh, luminosity how bright are these events well in the left hand side of this diagram here we see the the pulsars that we know and love that were discovered uh, back in the late 1960s they have a characteristic time scale of milliseconds for the individual pulses, and they have uh, some characteristic luminosity as well. What was incredible about uh, the Lorimer burst and fast radio burst in general, if you use that, that dispersive sweep as a proxy for distance, the Lorimer burst must have been at billions of light years distance, and hence the implied luminosity was enormous, you know, 12 orders of magnitude above that of pulsars. So whereas fast radio bursts, which have been discovered in, in basically the last decade or so, have similar time scales to pulsars because of their large and we've now verified extragalactic distances, they must be you know, trillions of times at least uh, more luminous uh, typically. So, so this is pretty hard to wrap your head around that uh, you know, we've been observing pulsars for half a century, that uh, we've been missing these, these, these fast radio bursts in the meantime. Now, this is obviously led to a, a, you know, a, a mystery about what's producing these bursts and it's created a lot of uh, research in the last, uh, last years into deciphering the nature of the fast radio bursts. One of the nice things about the field before I talk about uh, the science of fast radio bursts is the fact that, of course, you know, any astrophysical mystery uh, also attracts the, the, the attention of the public. That includes uh, the fact that you know, fast radio bursts have really entered pop, pop culture in many ways. So for instance, if you go on, on Spotify and if you search uh, on the term fast radio burst, you'll find album covers and songs that are, are in some way related to the phenomenon. So here on the left, this is like a graph that I made actually for, for a paper five or six years ago that's ended up on the cover of some album. There's some band that's called fast radio burst as well. There's a band that's called Lorimer burst as well. It's kind of funny if you're an astronomer to see this. Now, here are some of the shocking facts about fast radio bursts, just to cut to the chase. So obviously in the meantime, we figured out that uh, this is a genuine astrophysical phenomenon. Well, the first is that these are really short duration radio transients. So they last for a few milliseconds, as I'll show you in some cases, much less than a millisecond. And you know, if you blink your eyes, that lasts for about 200 milliseconds. So these are about 100 times shorter than the blink of an eye. We've now established that they're actually created uh, you know, long, long ago in galaxies far, far away. So they are genuine extragalactic transients as well. And you know, how much energy are we talking about in one of these radio bursts? Obviously, these radio bursts are energetically puny compared to the you know, other un unseen processes that are probably involved in their creation. 
But even the radio bursts themselves, they carry as much energy as the sun emits in, in one day, you know, assuming, uh, well, these bursts are certainly not isotropic in nature, but, uh, you know, if we were to assume some uh, isotropic equivalent energy, we're talking about uh, uh, amounts of energy that are comparable to what the sun emits in a day or so. So they're, you know, they're really, really bright radio bursts. They last for a short amount of time. They're coming from very far away. Um, you might, you know, if you're not working in the field, think, uh, well, these must be very rare things. That's why we haven't found them before. Um, but uh, one of the, the other fascinating things about fast radio bursts is the fact that, uh, that they're actually quite abundant. So if we have a, a very sensitive telescope, so something, you know, maybe with the sensitivity of the, the fast telescope in China, the largest single dish in the world, if that telescope were able to, to observe the entire sky simultaneously, well, it would be like a fireworks show, basically. You know, every, you know, 10 seconds or tens of seconds, we'd be seeing one of these flashes, uh, one of these fast radio bursts coming from somewhere on the sky. So they're really an abundant population of transients. And the fact that we haven't uh, previously discovered them with, you know, past generations of radio telescopes is because we're only now really moving into this regime of building wide field radio telescopes. And of course, Caltech is a leading institute in pushing this forward. Um, that are capable of finding these, you know, compared to uh, pulsars, relatively rare signals, but still quite abundant in, in the grand scheme of things. So, of course, one of the, you know, the driving research questions behind the field is what produces fast radio bursts. And many, many models have been uh, been proposed. You know, there are hundreds of, uh, of models or submodels that have been proposed in the literature. I'll point you, for instance, to this, this net, nice website that Emma Platts former PhD student in South Africa put together in which she's collated, you know, the different classes of models and created kind of a catalog that's useful if you're entering the field. And, uh, and because of the short durations and, and, and large energy, so high, high energy densities are, are required. Uh, many of these theories invoke neutron stars, black holes in a variety of different settings to try and explain the phenomenon. So, uh, you know, we've now established that uh, most of the FRBs that we're seeing are coming from outside the galaxy. I'll come to uh, a very interesting event in our own galaxy later in this talk. Um, these models, in some cases, are invoking you know, rotational power from, from a neutron star. In some cases, uh, these models are um, uh, invoking uh, magnetic power or, uh, or accretion power. So you can uh, you know, imagine models that uh, have you know, bursts on a magnetar, a highly magnetized neutron star. Or, or models that um, uh, have, uh, you know, the burst being produced in the jet, for instance, of, uh, of an accreting uh, source. Um, now, what, what, what good is this phenomenon to anyone anyway? So beyond the, the mystery of what, what, is, what is producing the fast radio burst, why do we care about this question? Well, like I said, these are obviously sites of extreme energy density. So I think the, the FRBs are really pointing us to, you know, extreme astrophysics in, in action. They're, they're really the signposts of uh, extreme astrophysical uh, processes, which we'd like to understand. Um, they might be pointing the way to a new type of astrophysical phenomenon that we were not uh, previously uh, uh, familiar with. And perhaps one of the most interesting, and I would say like long lasting legacies of this field, you know, even if we can figure out what uh, fast radio bursts are, or perhaps even if we don't, we can use these fast radio bursts as really unique probes of the intervening uh, uh, medium between us and the source. So radio waves are easily, easily affected by the intervening uh, ionized material, magnetic field, and they're really you know, precision probes, uh, in many cases, unique probes of the otherwise invisible material between us and the source. So what are these effects? You know, I've already told you about dispersion. So again, we see the Lorimer burst plot here on, on the left. Uh, this frequency dependent uh, delay. This allows us to measure the total column density of ionized material between us and the source. So this is a way of kind of like weighing the universe. You can weigh the interstellar medium around galaxy. You can constrain the, you know, the halo of our galaxy. You can constrain the, the baryonic matter uh, between galaxies or in the circumgalactic medium of galaxies. Um, we can measure effects like scintillation and scattering. So, for instance, this is a nice plot, which uh, I think actually is from one of Vikram's uh, papers, uh, where we can see the, the modulation of the brightness of this burst on very, very short uh, wavelength scales. So we can see it basically twinkling. 
Um, and the scintillation is telling us something about not just the total amount of material along the line of sight, it's essentially telling us how, how clumpy the material is along the line of sight, right? So we can also measure clumpiness, and this is interesting, for instance, for probing, you know, the halos of other galaxies to see whether the halos are kind of, you know, in cloudlets or, or more homogeneous in their, in their uh, densities. And the last, uh, last uh, propagation effect that I'll mention is Faraday rotation. So the other nice thing about radio bursts is, you know, doing polarimetry in radio is, is relatively, relatively straightforward, <laughs> I would say. And, and the radio waves are also subject to Faraday rotation. So basically, you know, the angle of, uh, of linear polarization that's going to rotate as a function of frequency. So if the bursts are highly, highly linearly polarized, we have some measure of the, the uh, electron density weighted magnetic field along the line side as well. So we have another way of you know, measuring the otherwise uh, invisible properties of the universe, in this case, the magnetic field by, by looking at Faraday rotation of the burst. So this is you know, a diagram showing you how, uh, how uh, a burst will be affected by different contributions from the, the host galaxy, from the intergalactic medium, the, the circumgalactic medium, for, for instance, if there's an intervening host galaxy along the line of sight, and then also passing through the halo uh, and the interstellar medium of our own galaxy. And uh, some of you in the audience might be saying, but all of these, these things are all mixed together. And indeed, that is one of the big challenges. We see the cumulative effect of all of these different contributions along the line of sight and picking them apart into separate contributions. You know, for instance, if you want to study in specifically the, the circumgalactic medium of an intervening galaxy, that you know, that's, uh, requires a bit of deftness to do that, uh, to do that carefully. So, you know, 14, 15 years ago, we started with the Lorimer burst. It took five or six years before the next uh, few fast radio bursts were found, then a few more years to, to discover the first repeating source, which I'll talk to you uh, about briefly. Uh, in the meantime, because of the, uh, you know, excitement in studying the phenomenon and, and using FRBs really as pre precision cosmological and astrophysical probes, a huge number of experiments have been started. And, uh, and dedicated facilities uh, are being built as well. So for instance, DSA-110, which I'm sure you've heard about many times uh, at Caltech, uh, are being constructed to, to detect a large number of FRBs, to, to pinpoint them on the sky, to figure out what is producing them, and to start using them to probe, probe other things. So even three or four years ago, we were in the regime of having less than 100 known sources. We're now in the regime where there are probably a few thousand sources, uh, of which about 600 are now published. So the field is really accelerating in its progress right now. We're finding lots of, of FRBs and starting to, starting to answer some of the, the big questions about them. And I'll just mention that you know, the last annual FRB conference was hosted online, unfortunately, because of corona. and. Um, all of those, those talks, if you're really interested in diving in deep into the field, are available on YouTube by a, a dedicated channel for the conference. And that includes also some, some introductory talks about the theory and the observations of FRBs if, uh, you know, if you're only just getting into the field. So um, one of the more detailed aspects of the background that I wanted to share is, is just the fact that some fast radio bursts are not uh, one-off events. Uh, they are not coming from cataclysmic uh, events. They're they're actually repeating sources. So I'm going to take you through this 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 other bit of background before I get into some of the the new results that I wanted to present. So um, the first repeating fast radio burst source was discovered only uh, about six years ago now. Uh, so this on the left hand side, this is a, a plot showing you the first eleven bursts that were detected from this uh, from this source. And these have all been corrected. These are, again, you know, dynamic spectra like the ones I was showing you before, where we can see the signal strength as a function of uh, radio frequency and as a function of time. In this case, that, that dispersive delay has been taken out, so don't get, don't confuse, uh, get confused by that. This, uh, this source was discovered with, uh, with the Arecibo telescope, uh, which you know, may be one of the, the highlights of Arecibo's career before its uh, untimely uh, collapse. Uh, in the last year or so, a very sad event, obviously. Um, but uh, the discovery of this one repeating source was incredibly uh, interesting because you know it's not so often in astrophysics that you have uh, an observation that so 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 cleanly rules out uh, an entire class of theories, right? So 
you know, knowing that, for instance, you know, one-off FRBs might be something different. It could be that one-off FRBs generally come from different types of sources or some, some different type of emission mechanism. At least the repeating FRBs, it's very clear, obviously, that they cannot be originating in some kind of cataclysmic event that destroys uh, the source that produced the burst, right? So, whereas, you know, the class of models that might involve, for instance, merging neutron stars or something like that, or supernovae or superluminous supernovae to produce fast radio bursts, while those, in theory, could, could uh, uh, still explain the, the observed one-off events, although there are some issues with considering that, you know, the rates, the relative rates of these, these two types of phenomena, um, it's clear that for repeating fast radio bursts that you need some longer lived source of energy. And these are interesting sources to study. Much of the talk I'll be talking actually about the, the, the subclass of repeating fast radio bursts because they're also very interesting sources to study because they keep, you know, keep doing their magic and you can keep uh, studying them in more and more detail. Now, uh, a big part of the game obviously is figuring out where these sources are coming from. And at the time of the, the Lorimer verse, there was not all that much follow up that could be done because the, the positional localization of the source was rather poor. It was, you know, localized to uh, at best maybe a few arc minutes or a few square arc minutes on the sky. Um, even a telescope like Arecibo, which had a very small field of view, only a few arc minutes across. If you consider the number of galaxies that could potentially be hosts of an FRB within that area of sky, you know, there's really dozens if not hundreds of potential hosts and it becomes completely ambiguous which of those hosts is, is the genuine uh you know origin of of their particular fast radio burst so um if you want to localize the specific host galaxy of a fast radio burst if you want to then determine the redshift of that host galaxy to get an independent measure of the distance to to the frb source that you can compare for instance to the the amount of dispersive delay that it's showing then you need much better localization you need you know on the order of arc second localization if not better okay so um at the time of the discovery of the the first repeating frb um of course uh, uh it was clear that you know this is one of the highest priorities localize some of these bursts to arc second precision if not better figure out which which host galaxy is uh, is the origin of this source and uh, and start studying this source in more detail. So this slide actually summarizes, I'm not going to go in, in great detail about this because this is uh, work that was uh, done a number of years ago and is probably familiar to many of those, uh, many of you in the audience. This slide is summarizing, you know, four papers and, and quite a bit of work, but essentially, you know, the, the, the real fast team at the VLA, which was led by uh, uh, Casey Law, together with Shami Chatterjee, they localized uh, some of the bursts from this source to arc second precision. We used the European VLBI array to, to try and uh, localize the sources, uh, source even better and to study uh, this persistent radio source that was also discovered at the same time. So quite interestingly, this first repeating source of fast radio bursts was, was found to be co coincident with a a very compact persistent radio source and when i say compact you know in in the in the host galaxy the angular extent or sorry the transverse extent is less than a parsec or so so really tiny uh source in the host galaxy which i'll come back to a little bit later uh it was possible with this precision localization in the radio to, to figure out the host galaxy to get its redshift and it turned out to be a very low mass low metallicity dwarf galaxy um, type of galaxy actually that is often associated with things like superluminous supernovae long gamma ray bursts um, and also you know in, in follow-up observations that we did with the hubble space telescope we we're able to find that uh, the source was not only uh, co um, associated with a, a dwarf galaxy it was also found on top of a bright knot of star formation within that host galaxy so it seemed like there was some association between the source and a young stellar population and also it was associated with a persistent radio source, very compact uh, radio source, maybe supernova remnant, maybe some kind of nebula around the source. And, uh, and for those of you who work in X-ray and gamma ray astronomy, unfortunately no X-rays or gamma rays were found. Okay, so what else were we able to learn about this source? And I'm giving this as background to, to some of the other sources I'll be discussing later. So this source is in a dwarf galaxy, low metallicity, high specific star formation rate, it's on top of this persistent radio source, might be a nebula. What else did we find out about it? Well, by looking at the bursts at higher frequencies, higher radio frequencies, and doing polarimetry to try and measure this Faraday rotation effect, 
we were able to, to determine the so-called Faraday rotation measure, which is again, a, um, uh, it is essentially telling us about the electron density uh, weighted magnetic field along the line of sight. So you can see the Faraday rotation effect here. So this, this oscillation as a function of frequency and the Stokes parameters is, is showing you how the, the linear uh, polarization is, uh, is, is rotating an angle as a function of frequency. And we're able to determine that the source is really in an extreme magneto-ionic environment. So the, the electron density and magnetic field are very large. You think local to the source because we actually saw that the, the rotation measure was changing on very short time scales, indicating that it must be something happening very local to the source as opposed to along the line of sight. And how, how extreme, you know, what, you know, what do I mean by extreme? Well, the only other kind of, you know, impulsive radio source that we knew of with such a high Faraday rotation measure is actually a magnetar in our own galaxy in the galactic center uh, that was found in the last few years. This has a comparable rotation measure to the source we found. So it seems, it seems like it's in like a galactic center-like environment. It's possible it's, you know, in the, in the vicinity of a, an accreting massive black hole. It's also possible that maybe it's in a dense nebula and hence that this repeating source is really a very, very young source that is still in uh, a nebula or a supernova remnant. Okay. What else have we been able to uh, determine about the source? Uh, well, we've studied the bursts in quite a bit of detail, and we've looked at really at how the bursts look like as a function of time and as a function of frequency. So these plots, again, are these type of dynamic spectrum plots that I showed you before. So it's showing you how bright the signal is as a function of frequency and as a function of time. And these plots have actually been, again, corrected for that dispersive delay. So all of that delay that's imparted by the intergalactic medium and the interstellar medium has been taken out. And you can see that, strangely, these sources still have some kind of sweep as a function of frequency to later times. So this is, uh, it's like the signal is, is marching down in frequency. We also see that the signal is kind of confined in, in radio frequency and that the radio frequency is shifting downwards towards later times. Uh, this is actually a 3D, 3D print of uh, this fast radio burst that's shown on the left there. So this is essentially showing you radio frequency as a function of time. And then this is how bright the radio burst is. Don't poke your eye on this, obviously. And, and what do we think is going on here? Well, this type of phenomenon is also seen, for instance, in like solar type three solar bursts, where it's kind of a radius to frequency mapping effect. So potentially what we're seeing here is that the emission region, there's some central source of energy and it's producing uh, a fast radio burst that, that where the radio burst is being produced, that emission is, uh, the emission site is changing as a function of time. And as it's moving further away from the central source, it's maybe going to areas of lower plasma density, lower uh, uh, local magnetic field strength. And the characteristic emission frequency at which it's visible is also shifting accordingly. And some people have called this the, the sad trombone effect because, you know, if you convert this to a sound, it's kind of like the burst is going wah, 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 as, it's, uh, as it's marching down to lower frequency. So again, an interesting clue about, you know, maybe some of the, the emission physics here, right? And, uh, and lastly, the last thing I'll say about this first uh, repeating FRB source is, uh, you know, if you look at the source on, on short time scales, if you observe, say, for an hour or so, you'll see that the bursts are basically uh, Poisson distributed with some, some particular rate. And that rate can change from, from day to day, from week to week. So uh, certainly it's not a, a Poisson process with a constant rate over the time scales of weeks or months. And quite interestingly, though, uh, there are these sources tend to have peaks at lower waiting times. So this is a, a histogram, obviously, of the wait time between bursts. And uh, this peak here is due to um, the Poisson occurrence of, uh, of the bursts uh, at some particular rate. But we also see a second bump at a few tens of milliseconds or so. So there seems to be some clustering of bursts on pretty short time scales, only tens of milliseconds. And quite interestingly, magnetars and their X-ray bursts show something quite similar to this. So this has led some people to conjecture that maybe this is really pretty good proof that uh, some of these repeating sources are related to magnetars, a point that I'll come back to <laughs> shortly, actually. So um, last few slides before I start talking about some of the new work that we've been doing here in Amsterdam. Uh, so again, you know, localization is really a key aspect of, of studying FRBs because localization gives you a host galaxy. You can figure out where the source is in a host galaxy. Is it close to star formation? Is it far out? This is important for understanding, you know, say prompt channels, you know, related to young stellar populations or delayed channels related, for instance, to binary merger. 
Um, localizing a repeating source is in many ways easier, even though I wouldn't call it easy, it's easier than localizing non-repeating uh, FRBs, but uh, the community has managed to even localize non-repeating FRBs the last few years. Uh, so this includes, for instance, the great work that's been done uh, with the ASCAP telescope in Australia, which uh, has been a very powerful telescope for FRBs, even though it wasn't designed to, uh, to search and localize FRBs from the beginning. The aspects of this telescope that make it very powerful are the fact that they uh, have equipped these telescopes with a focal plane array such that each one of the dishes is observing a very large field of view. And these dishes are also separated over reasonably large geographical distances. And so you can get a, a, a very accurate, uh, very precise interferometric localization of any, any bursts that you detect. So it's possible with ASCAP to localize sources to arc second or better precision. And this has also been demonstrated with the, the um, precursor to the DSA-110, the DSA-10 back at the time, uh, work that, uh, that Vikram and Greg did uh, uh, a few years ago to, to also localize a one-off FRB. And we're at the stage now that, you know, we have, I think, a few thousand FRBs that have been discovered. 600 are now in the literature, at least, but still actually only maybe 15 or 20 FRBs have actually been localized to a host galaxy because we're still, you know, on the, the edge of being able to do this for large numbers of FRBs to get large samples of well-localized uh, fast radio bursts. And what we've seen so far is to a certain degree that you can find FRBs in quite a wide range of, of host galaxies. I would tend to say that the repeating sources are typically found close to, but potentially significantly offset from, from local star formation. And some of the non-repeating sources have been found in galaxies that don't obviously have very active star formation ongoing. So we're finding FRBs in, in a wide, wide range of, uh, of locations out to redshifts of maybe 0.5 or so at this point. And what I would like to do in the, the second half of the talk is to tell you some of the things that we've been doing here uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, this is part of uh, the, the AstroFlash research group that we have here at the University of Amsterdam and at Astron, which is kind of the Dutch version of NREO. It's the Netherlands Institute for Radio Astronomy. Um, and I've grouped this into kind of four or four topics. First, I'm going to talk about our efforts to localize FRBs to milli arc second precision. Then I'm going to talk about, you know, dissecting the properties of the bursts on the shortest possible time scales and also, uh, you know, with full, full polarimetric information. So really, you know, nanosecond, microsecond spectropolarimetry. I'm going to tell you a bit about high cadence monitoring. So basically, picking interesting sources and, and, and staring at them for as long as, uh, as feasible, or as long as the student is, uh, is, is patient enough to do so. And, and I'm also gonna talk to you a little bit about looking uh, at FRBs at very low frequencies. So let's first talk uh, a little bit about localizing FRBs to the, uh, the highest possible precision. So what we've been doing is we've been, we've been using the CHIME telescope in Canada which is a uh, really like the world's best FRB finder because of its enormous 200 square degree field of view, CHIME is capable of finding a few FRBs per day at this point, which is really phenomenal given that it took, you know, the better part of a decade to find the first three or four FRBs, you know, we're now finding that many every single day, uh, or at least CHIME is, I'm not a member of CHIME, I should say. Um, so CHIME is able to find a large number of FRBs. It's currently not capable of localizing them precisely enough to, to figure out which host galaxy that they're coming from, although they're going to be extending uh, CHIME with outriggers to, to do this better. And what we've been doing is we've been taking the, the repeating sources that CHIME finds, and we've been uh, doing follow-up observations with the European VLBI network, which uh, I would argue is the world's most precise FRB localizing machine in the sense that uh, the European VLBI array offers very long baselines for high precision, high resolution uh, radio interferometry, and also provides quite a bit of sensitivity because it includes some very large radio telescopes. So what we're in, endeavoring to do here is, you know, we take a localization from CHIME, which uh, is maybe, you know, this large on the sky compared to the full moon. And then we, you know, uh, we want to look at this field, zoom in to figure out which, which possible galaxy within that localization region is, is the true galaxy. And we want to do better than just figuring out what the host galaxy is. We want to figure out, you know, what part of the host galaxy can the source be found. So we did this uh, a, a couple of years ago uh, already with, uh, with the first uh, source, which is one of the first repeating uh, fast radio burst sources. 
uh, called uh, colloquially called R3 because it was the third repeating source to be discovered. And, uh, and this is the host galaxy that we were able to identify, uh, relatively face on spiral galaxy at a luminosity distance of about 150 megaparsecs or so. It's a redshift of like 0.03. Um, you can see the spiral arms here. You can see the localization here to this outer spiral arm, the strange V shape. It almost looks like the universe is pointing at the, the position of the source. And, um, and again, it was possible not only to localize the, the host galaxy itself, it was possible to, to pinpoint the source within the host galaxy so precisely, in fact, that when we followed up with uh, Hubble Space Telescope observations, so you can see again the host galaxy here, much sharper uh, in, with Hubble than it was with, uh, with Gemini, you can see that V-shaped uh, structure breaks up into a few knots of star formation. And this tiny little dot here is the milli arc second localization of, uh, of the source, of the burst source, the FRB source itself. In fact, that dot is larger than the actual uh, un uncertainty on the, on the position. And, and you can see the local knots of star formation there. You can see that this repeating fast rate of burst source is quite close to, but not really at the peak of, of local star formation. And in this paper, you know, we obviously point out the, the proximity of local star formation, suggesting a uh, short delayed channel for, uh, uh, for, for the source, but also conjecture that maybe, you know, this offset from, from local star formation could be meaningful because, you know, assuming that this uh, is some, for instance, neutron star that's producing these radio bursts, perhaps a highly magnetized neutron star, uh, unless that neutron star was formed from, you know, a runaway star, uh, one might expect that the, the neutron star was actually uh, uh, actually formed uh, somewhere closer to the peak of local star formation. And hence, we're seeing a system that is maybe not tens of years old or hundreds of years old, but perhaps hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years old. Um, more recently, uh, what we've been doing is, of course, following up other repeating uh, FRBs from, from CHIME. And CHIME is, because it's, you know, detecting very large samples of fast rate bursts, including over like two dozen at this point uh, repeating, repeating sources, which is a huge step forward in the last couple of years or so. Uh, CHIME is also finding some really rare nearby sources, a really like local universe uh, fast rate bursts, which are fantastic because particularly, you know, if you're focusing on getting the best uh, possible uh, localization of the radio burst, then you want the source to be nearby enough that it's really worthwhile to have that high quality localization so you can also get high quality uh, resolved images of what's, what's going on in the local environment. So Mohit Barwach, who works uh, as a PhD student at, uh, at McGill, he, uh, he published quite recently uh, in about the last year or so, a really nice paper in which one of the CHIME FRB sources that was seen to be repeating was in the direction of the M81 spiral galaxy, which is, of course, you know, a beautiful grand design spiral uh, at only a few few megaparsecs distance. Um, the FRB was constrained to be coming from this, this red circle here, so that was the localization uncertainty region of the source. And within that region, there were a number of potentially interesting counterparts, like an X-ray source, a, uh, a known globular cluster, etc. cetera. And, uh, and we followed up the source using the European VLBI array in the efforts of trying to, to localize it to uh, at least arc second, if not uh, sub arc second precision. And we were fortunate to, to do that in the last year. So on the left-hand side, uh, this is a radio image, uh, both a dirty map and a clean image of uh, of a few radio bursts combined together. And it was possible to localize the source, not just to arc second precision, but to milli arc second precision. And we were really quite astonished uh, to see that the source is coincident with a globular cluster that is part of the M81 galactic system. So this is a globular cluster uh, that seems like a fairly typical kind of, you know, 10 billion year old, old stellar population globular cluster, maybe, you know, a few hundred thousand uh, stars. Um, not at all like the you know uh, last repeating source that I showed you that is close to uh, to local star formation, um, and uh, with the precision we were able to achieve with the with the VLBI, it was even possible to to demonstrate that it looks like the source is slightly offset from the the exact core of this cluster, 
And uh, you know, a number of people uh, have conjectured about what this might mean. Could be that this uh, repeating fast radio burst source is, is a magnetar, but a magnetar formed through uh, accretion-induced collapse or binary merger. Um, there's also some ideas about maybe it could be some type of extreme uh, millisecond pulsar or, or uh, greeting system in the, in, the, in the cluster as well. So in any case, you know, really quite a, a different type of source from, from the R3 source that I was just showing you, suggesting that there might be multiple uh, formation channels for FRBs. And we've been continuing this, I mean, just to round off this, this theme, we've been continuing this uh, for a number of other uh, Chime FRB repeaters. So we, I think we have another three or so that uh, have milliarc second precision uh, localizations at this point. And this is one of the other recent examples. So this is again a highly, in this case, highly active repeater where it was uh, fairly easy to detect many bursts from the source, localize those bursts to uh, a few milliarc second precision. And then in this case, uh, we see that uh, the source is located with quite a, uh, a dusty galaxy at a redshift of about uh, 0.1 or so, and uh, is coincident with, uh, with local star formation. So quite different than the globular cluster uh, local environment that I was just showing you. So now I'd like to, to, to switch to a, a slightly different topic, but you know, using the same data, because we need voltage data, uh, so amplitude and phase information data from, from all of the radio telescopes in, uh, in the VLBI array to, uh, to, to make interferometric maps, we can use the same, the same data essentially to, uh, to look at uh, these bursts at very high time resolution and also with full, uh, full polarimetry. So we've been doing that by using the largest telescope in the array that we have uh, available, and that's the Effelsberg 100 meter telescope in Germany, which is about, uh, well, 200 kilometers uh, that way or so. And, um, and this allows us to, you know, not just zoom in on the burst at milli arc second uh, angular scales, but also, you know, zoom in to the burst on microsecond, even sub microsecond time scales. And again, Effelsberg provides a, a very high sensitivity so we can get good signal to noise even on these short time scales. And this, uh, you know, this graph, there's a lot of panels here, so don't, don't get lost in all the panels. But uh, essentially, these, uh, these bursts, when you, when you zoom in on them, at least some of these fast radio bursts from, from these repeating sources, as you zoom uh, into them on, uh, on shorter and shorter time scales, you will see that you take some burst that uh, is uh, still unresolved at, say, 16 microsecond time resolution. One ramps up the time resolution to a few microseconds or so, and you can see that there is structure on microsecond time scales. So, you know, ignoring relativistic effects, you know, you're talking about light travel times that uh, uh, correspond to like, you know, regions of, of only a few uh, kilometers or so. So this is one way of constraining the emission region. Um, we've also done this for another repeating source. This is the one in the, the M81 globular cluster. Uh, Walid uh, and Tom and others wrote a nice paper about uh, this source as well. Um, and here it was possible to actually even resolve uh, structure down to tens of nanosecond time scales or so. And why is this, this is interesting? Well, we would argue that this is kind of difficult to accommodate in FRB models that suggest that the, the radio bursts are being uh, produced far out from, from the central engine in some kind of relativistic shock. Uh, we think this more naturally fits with models that suggest that the bursts are, are produced in the, in the uh, magnetosphere of, uh, for instance, of, of magnetar. That's still debated for sure. And the other thing that's interesting about this is, you know, these searches that I've been showing you, like Chime, for instance, uh, Chime is finding a few fast radio bursts per day, as I told you, um, because it's scanning a large area of sky. But Chime, uh, to keep up with a large amount of data that's coming in, needs to be doing these searches on time scales of about a millisecond or so, which is really quite fantastic. But a millisecond is still a limiting time resolution when it comes to fast radio bursts. And, and so what we've been doing with this type of data as well is we've been doing blind searches where instead of searching the data at millisecond time scales to find what's called them classical FRBs that you can see on, on time scales of a few milliseconds, we've been searching the data on microsecond, even sub microsecond time scales. And what we've been finding is that uh, uh, some of these repeating FRB sources uh, not only show structure in their bursts on the, these very, very short time scales, um, what you can see in a blind search is you can find FRBs that I would call uh, ultra fast uh, radio bursts that are really only visible in searches on time scales of a few microseconds or so. So 
it seems like there could potentially be a very large population of fast radio bursts out there that we're completely blind to right now because we're just searching on too coarse a time resolution. Uh, so even ASCAP is searching on time scales of like a, a millisecond or so. And there could be, uh, I think we have at least a hint that there could be a large population of radio bursts out there that if it were possible to search over very large areas of sky at on time scales that are a thousand times shorter than what we're currently doing, and of course this is a huge computational challenge, that there's still even more to find in this in this parameter space. Okay, and now the next topic, the next thing that we can do with these dishes in this interferometric array, um, because we're using you know these dishes of the European VLBI array, sometimes as an ad hoc array, sometimes uh, in session VLBI observations. Sometimes it is possible to observe with a few of these dishes that form the, the European VLBI network, to observe with them at higher cadence, not as an interferometer, but as individual dishes that are each pointed to, to some source of interest. And this can be quite rewarding scientifically as well, doing this type of high cadence monitoring. And uh, you know, this has been demonstrated quite nicely by uh, you know, the work that was done uh, by Chris Bohenek uh, during his PhD at Caltech, where it was possible to uh, to find this galactic, very bright radio burst from, from a galactic magnetar, uh, a burst uh, with uh, you know, fluences of about, uh, about a megajansky or so. Uh, the same event was detected with the Chime telescope far, far off axis. So in the last year, we've also seen a bright radio burst from a galactic magnetar, suggesting you know, really a very strong connection potentially between magnetars and fast radio burst because this burst from this galactic magnetar was so bright that if you were to place this, this magnetar at a distance of a few tens of, of megaparsecs, it would essentially look like a, an FRB. So a pretty strong, strong connection between magnetar radio bursts and, and FRBs. We sat on this source using uh, a number of radio telescopes in, in Europe, not as uh, an interferometric array, but really to try and get as much on sky time as possible towards this source. And uh, using the, one of the Westerbork dishes here in the Netherlands, it was possible in about a billion seconds of data, or actually a few billion seconds of, of observations, to detect one, one and a half milliseconds of signal out of those few billion milliseconds of data and detect two additional bright radio bursts, orders of magnitude less bright than the original one found by Chris and, and, and the STAIR2 uh, team. Um, and, uh, and why is this interesting? You know, finding a few more very, very sporadic, very rare bright bursts from this galactic magnetar. Well, what I think is fascinating is if you look at the single source, we know it's a neutron star, it's a magnetar, so it's highly, highly magnetized. The energy budget is dominated by the, the release of stored magnetic energy. What you can see is that this single source, SGR 1935, it produces radio bursts spanning about seven orders of magnitude in, uh, in luminosity, right? So this source is essentially bridging from kind of the brightest pulses that we see from pulsars all the way to the weakest bursts that we see from fast radio bursts in a single in a single source. And you know, you could ask the question, you know, is the really, really bright burst, is that an FRB? Are the weaker ones something different? You know, at what point do you stop calling it an FRB? Uh, I think it's fascinating that a single neutron star can produce uh, radio bursts over such a huge uh, uh, range of luminosities. And when I was talking to Wenbin just uh, just before the colloquium, uh, I got the impression he, that he thought, and I think I agree with them, it must be like several different emission mechanisms because having a single emission mechanism that can produce you know, um, bursts spanning such a large range of luminosity seems, seems a little bit impossible. So what does this mean in terms of, you know, like what, times, uh, what types of short duration transients are we finding at this point? Well, let's look again at this transient parameter space that I showed you earlier in the talk. If we consider the time scales of, uh, of radio transients, now only going to you know, time scales of about a second down to, to nanoseconds or so. You know, we've seen from galactic sources, pulsars, and in particular, the very young crab pulsar, we've seen uh, bursts on time scales of milliseconds, microseconds, uh, nanoseconds, and we've seen these FRBs, um, you know, typically with time scales of milliseconds or so. But in, in the research that uh, we've done in just you know, the last few years or so, We've really been able to fill. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, one sec. Okay, sorry, that was just a. Uh, oh, now, now they're going to do it in English as well. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Sorry, 
OK. Sorry for the automated uh, announcement from our building here in Amsterdam. Um, so uh, you know, you could ask the question, in this transient parameter space where we're looking over a huge range of time scales and a huge range of uh, luminosities, and we see you know, this island of fast radio bursts, and we see these, uh, these, these pulsars, you could ask the question, you know, uh, is there anything else populating this transient parameter space in this, in this large gap here? And what we've been able to see in the last few years uh, by, by targeting uh, some of these nearby fast radio bursts uh, found by Chime and also this galactic magnetar, what we can see essentially is that, yeah, you can actually fill in this parameter space and you can find uh, bursts on a, you know, spanning this whole range of luminosities and timescales, suggesting that if future surveys, uh, you know, really focus on, on exploring the full range of, of luminosities and the full range of timescales, that there's a lot more out there to see, that we've really only scratched the surface in terms of what type of uh, radio bursts we can see on a range of, you know, distance scales, a range of time scales, et cetera, with various you know, different scientific applications. And, uh, and I know, for instance, you know, it's like uh, Liam is working on this G-Rex uh, uh, follow-up to, to STAIR-2. Uh, I think these types of uh, dedicated experiments targeting certain parts of this parameter space are going to be really profitable in the next uh, decade. So I'm cognizant of the time, and it looks like I'm actually starting to, to run out of time. So I'm going to just mention a couple other things before I try and wrap the, the talk together. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, this high cadence monitoring that we're doing with these single dishes is really continuing to pay off. So a student here in, uh, in, in Amsterdam, uh, Omar Ubukatin, has been uh, looking at this prolific uh, uh, repeating source called the FRB 2020-11-24A. And, and he's actually spent about 3,000 hours of 25 meter telescope time uh, looking for extremely bright bursts from the source. And we've been able to detect what we think are some of the very brightest fast radio bursts in terms of their fluence that have ever been detected. So some of these are like Kilijansky millisecond uh, radio bursts um, that are uh, you know, still that bright, even though the, the source is at a redshift of about 0.1 or so. And we're, what, you know, why are we doing this? One of the main reasons is to really understand the tail of the burst energy distribution. You know, what, you know, what, what is a, the burst energy distribution over a large range of energies? Because this is really critical to understanding uh, how to, uh, what, what we can expect with future experiments um, uh, by probing different areas of the parameter space. So because I would like to uh, leave some time for questions, I'll just blitz through the, the LOFAR uh, uh, part of the talk. Uh, we have been detecting fast radio bursts with LOFAR as well. Uh, this repeating source uh, has been detected. Um, and we've detected another repeating source with LOFAR. Uh, we're starting to target the M81 source in earnest as well. This is another way of probing the local environments because at very low radio frequencies, we're particularly sensitive to, to propagation effects. And uh, yeah, and I would like to conclude the talk by really uh, emphasizing again that I think there's really a bright future for this type of, of research in terms of opening up this parameter space for fast radio bursts. At this point, I would say we still are, uh, I think we're still scratching our heads about what is actually producing the phenomenon. I think uh, there is mounting evidence for multiple types of FRBs potentially coming from different types of astrophysical sources, if not at least different emission mechanisms. And um, let me just skip to this slide. Again, the parameter space that remains to be explored is huge in terms of time scales, uh, radio frequencies, and luminosities. And I think future experiments need to focus both on you know, trying to find ultra fast radio bursts by searching time scales of microseconds or less, but also actually you know, not so fast radio bursts, I would call them, on, by searching you know, at much higher sensitivity time scales of you know, a fraction of a second up to a few seconds, because this is also very poorly explored at this point. Yeah, so uh, why do FRBs have a bright future? The high event rate is your really abundant transient uh, population from extragalactic distances. Uh, at the same time, not only do we have a lot of these bursts or will we have a lot of these bursts with future wide uh, field radio telescopes, the, the bursts themselves are really exceptional probes um, because of you know, their spectrotemporal polar metric properties and the propagation effects that we can see imprinted on them. Uh, we can localize them with exceptional precision. We can figure out exactly where they're coming from. And, uh, and I think, as I've said a number of times, there's an even larger phase space to explore. So uh, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions that there may be.
Thank you, Jason. That was a great talk. Um, so if you have questions, can you please raise hand or, okay. So I see the first question that's from Casey in the chat. Um, uh, let me just read that. Um, Casey says the beam size of FRB emission is a major nuisance factor in population modeling. Yep, definitely. What are the prospects for measuring the beaming angle of FRB emission? Uh, yeah, I think that's a great question. I was talking to Waleed about something similar to this uh, just before the talk, and Waleed was, um, and I were um, kind of picking each other's brains on um, why is it the case that FRB seem to be harder and harder to detect as you go to higher and higher radio frequencies. Uh, and I was pointing out that uh, it seems for the sources we have been able to detect at, at frequencies of many gigahertz that they also typically become narrower. So I think I think maybe what we're seeing is that the beaming angle is narrower at higher frequencies. And maybe with uh, multi-frequency observations of a large number of FRBs, we can start constrain the, the beaming angle a bit better, Casey. OK, um, I see Catherine has her hand up. When you showed nanosecond structure from EVN observations, was that uh, detected by inverting a polyphase filter bank? It was not. That was that was still within the in individual IF. So we didn't we didn't try oh, and wow. put subbands together. Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, that was uh, that was only on timescales of tens of nanoseconds. We're trying to go to to a few nanosecond timescales now. But of course, that involves you know sampling a, a wider band. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Catherine. Um, Still, do you want to please ask your question? Yeah, hi, Jason. Uh, lots of exciting things. Thank you. Um, so one thing I, I was a little confused in the microsecond burst, was that at the DM and position of a repeater that you were looking at, or was that found sort of in a blind survey? I was a bit the, the, yeah, it was it was semi-blind in the sense that that was towards the, the first known repeating source. So uh, we knew where to look and we knew you know what DM to look at. But other than that, it was blind. Yeah. Right. But but the, the event that you saw was consistent with the position in DM of the repeater. Yeah, that's correct. Although, um, interestingly, there are some subtle variations. It seems like there's some subtle variations in the DM uh, at a small level that are, are hard to are hard to reconcile. I mean, we're fairly, you know, uh, firmly convinced that these are bursts from that source, but we'd like to understand um, why the dispersion measure seems to be bobbling around at some small level. Is it small level is what like, like point 0.1 or point point two, mm -hmm. yeah because that's kind of the, the level of dm precision that you have at the microsecond level thanks still uh liam thanks so micro microstructure in pulsars is often periodic or quasi periodic and the period of the microstructure relates to the spin period mm. um, so what do you think the prospects are for actually saying something about something like spin period for FRB now that quasi periodicity is, is sort of common in fast radio burst microstructure? Um, we have not convincingly seen, you know, uh, reproducible quasi periodicities in, um, in any of the high time resolution work that we've done. I did point out the like few tens of millisecond uh, waiting time bump for, for the first repeater. Um, I don't think that is related to rotation. Um, I mean, I would love I would love to figure out the rotation period of of one of these sources, but I am currently kind of inclined to believe that the bursts are not at some stable emission site that's locked to the you know the rotational phase of the of, uh, of the central object that they're happening sporadically enough um, that is just very difficult to determine an underlying rotational period. Okay, uh, thanks, Liam. Kunal has another question in the chat. Uh, uh, Kunal asks, in the EVN precise, do you work around the telescope scheduling to maximize the probability of finding bursts during the observing? Um, work around the telescope schedule. Well, essentially, largest dishes in the array, they determine when we're going to be observing. Uh, we have to phase referencing Kunal to really get uh, accurate uh, positions so that um, means that the on sky time is more like 60 percent of the total observing time unfortunately um does that answer your question or were you getting at something slightly different um i 
think he can post it in the chat. Uh, maybe. Okay. Um, meanwhile, uh, so we are almost at the end of the, we are at the end of the hour. So one quick question from Ben Ben um, would be probably our last question for today. Yeah, I want to ask about the kilojames per millisecond at the redshift point one that you mentioned. So those are very rare. So I wonder what what do we know about the all sky rates of such extraordinarily bright FRVs, or um, and how do they compare to the ASCAP measurements? Um, ASCAP yeah. those, those bursts are now not localized. We don't know where they're from. So are they actually consistent? Um, I don't have a complete answer. I know in the you know in the early days before ASCAP was running uh, inter interferometrically, they were pointing the dishes uh, like in a fly's eye yeah. configuration, and and those were kind of near universe uh, bursts. We think depending uh, well based on their dispersion measure, and they were kind of like hundreds of uh, Jansky millisecond type bursts. Um, so I I think you know even compared to those that you know a few of the events from this source are. Are even brighter, at least by a factor of a few, than that, or I should say, maybe more luminous is maybe the better way of putting it. Um, but that's from like thousands of hours of observing a single source. Um, so uh, what you're getting at is maybe what what well, you should ask Liam Connor. I'm sure he can figure it out for you quite uh, quite accurately. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. I guess that was our last question for today. Let's thank Jason again for the wonderful talk. Um, and thank you all for joining. If you have more questions, you can hang out here or send them to Jason and 